he couldn't not be passionate about almost anything that was of interest to him. He was a lifelong learner, so inquisitive, loved to encounter new information or expand his formidable fund of knowledge. I was struck by his devotion. He's just devoted to his career, to his community, to his family. You have been mentioning the hand washing story and I was so <laughs> amazed he would share it with me again he would remind me from time to time do you remember the first time we met and what you said about hand washing I had no idea he had spent the last few decades telling other people <laughs> about the story um and uh I think I was naive in some respects I've never considered myself a disrespectful person, but we were going from room to room doing medical rounds. And I'd come from the University of Vermont and we just had an infectious disease department that was, uh, they were fascist practically. I mean, it was really drilled into us. And then all of a sudden I'm at Seattle Children's and we're doing bedside rounds with your father, who is just a genius at that, loves to teach, you know, loves to include the family. He's got all these little nuggets of wisdom, but we're in the third room. And I realized like, I'm the only, I'm missing, I'm late because I'm the only one going to the sink and washing up. And it's pre Purell, you know, and pre COVID for sure. And finally, I couldn't help it. I was just like, doesn't anybody wash their hands here? And you could have heard a pin drop. I think I think Julie Womack was the senior at that point, but I was just like there were medical students and we probably had a group of about six or seven people and everybody just froze. And I realized I'm like, oh God, I probably shouldn't have said that. Like <laughs> I said the quiet part out loud. And your dad turned and looked right at me, you know, with those eyes. And, he's, and he just, his big grin, that huge smile. And he just threw his head back and laughed. And he said, I knew I liked you. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't anybody else say anything about this? So he's the only one who observed this. You're absolutely right. We need to start washing our hands. I just got carried away. <laughs> but I was like, ah. Thank God it was him and not somebody else. But um, it's his delight, his delight in engagement and authenticity that way. It was um, always on his nickel. That was for sure. You know, he had to be of, the, of, he was very busy. He had his finger involved in a lot of things, right? And as you heard, like one of Ellie's stories was, it wasn't uncommon to hear him listening to his classical music in his office, right? Or reading through some articles and stuff. So I did find I had that uh, clinic at Harborview and a lot depended on whether or not Abe wanted to be engaged at that moment. You know, it wasn't that he was disinterested. It was about where he wanted to spend his intellectual capital. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't uncommon for me, like I hadn't seen, for example, coming from Maine and studying in Vermont, I had encountered, and I'm very ashamed to say, one non-white person, patient, in five years of training. And it was somebody making their way from DC up to Montreal um, with their family when this, when this little girl got sick and wound up in the hospital. So when it comes to you know, ethnic differences, in this case, it was a rash that somebody from the Ethiopian community had come in with. It, both their kids had the same rash. I wasn't great on rashes to begin with. I did not know how to interpret them in pigmented skin. It's just a, an art and takes experience and it's not impossible, but I hadn't had the experience. So he was my attending and I called him, Abe, I've got this family here and these children have a rash and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> he said, so why are you calling me? <laughs> I said, because you're my attending. And he said, that doesn't mean I know what this is. That doesn't mean I need to be there showing you. I am not the person for that. You need to turn to the senior residents. They'll help you out. They learn the hard way. That's what's going to happen. Now, I have to get back. I forget what symphony he was listening to. I have to get back to this. The good part's coming. <laughs> it was like, click. Yeah. So the reason I tell that is because, first of all, you wanted like the good, the bad, and the ugly, but also... From anybody else, that might have been sort of like that person's lazy or that person isn't interested in education or that person won't make time for me. That 
that could easily be the way somebody might perceive your dad, but it wasn't who he was. Oh. He was already engaged in something and he triaged the information that came in and thought to himself, I do not need to stop what I'm doing right now and go down there. You have other resources. This is not the right time to be doing that. That's what he was saying. And he was empowering me. Exactly. To, yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. over time, you realize that. And so those parts that would seem, you know, uh, fractious or rough around the edges, you realize, I would say he was kind when it mattered, mm -hmm. desperately kind, sincerely kind. And he was a bit rough when it was necessary. That's how I always thought about Abe. And Let's I see, bedside rounds were a real treat with him um, because he would often have the resident do the exam. It wasn't like your dad would do a whole lot of the exams when I was there, but he, his fund of knowledge and his understanding of the history of medicine and his ability to connect where we got to today, you know, why treatment today looks so different than what it was before was really refreshing. And I realized over time, that that's an anchor that we get as people in training in the medical profession. You can read the latest protocols for how to assess and treat diseases. You can do what is now sort of au courant. But if you're divorced completely from how we got here, if you forget the history of medicine piece of it, and you don't have an appreciation for the struggles that, that got us to where we are today, um, you don't have much of a foundation. Um, anyway, so that I really got from him and I found those conversations endlessly fascinating. Um, yeah, he also helped me become comfortable not knowing everything. There's that security where if, as long as I know almost everything I need to know right now, I'll always have an answer for new situations that pop up. And of course, that's not how it works either. He definitely helped me get comfortable with instinct and using what little I did have in order to head in the right direction with diagnosis and treatment. And then I think the other thing I took away from Abe much more than most mentors was um, before patient-centered care was a thing people talked about, before making sure including the family in discussions of treatment like quality of life or goals of care, he was doing that. He was doing it in his own way. Well, yeah. um, nobody would have mistaken him for um, you know, a palliative care physician sitting down, allowing these pregnant pauses to take time until somebody came up with their own ideas. But he really, really was focused on the patient and the family. And he understood if you don't include them in this process and you're not addressing the concerns and questions they have, even if you don't think it's relevant, that itself is something you have to get over because if you haven't if you haven't addressed their questions and needs no matter how great a job you think you've done you have failed you have you have failed to make the biggest difference to them so i definitely got that from your dad and incorporated that in my practice too i remember uh, internship and second year were extremely rough for us that was when the e coli outbreak happened with Jack in the Box. Oh, wow. It was just never want to go back there again. So of course, we would bemoan our existence and we would rant and rave about how we didn't have a life and we weren't ever leaving the campus. And I'll never forget your dad. He says, here's what I don't understand. You call yourself residents. We were residents. Do you know what that means? It yeah. means you are resident in the hospital. It's your home. That's where you live. You don't leave. You're not a resident. <laughs> in the middle of this moment where you're like, oh, my life sucks so bad. And he's like, yeah, but you don't live here like I did. And I love that. 